Hello, I'm Graeme Hill. Welcome to the Global Church Project. Along with Michael Frost, Alan Hirsch founded the Forge Mission Training Network. He currently leads Future Travellers, an innovative learning program helping megachurches become missional. Known for his innovative approach to mission, Alan Hirsch is a teacher and key mission strategist for churches across the Western world. His popular book, The Shaping of Things to Come, written with Michael Frost, is widely considered to be a seminal text on mission. Alan Hirsch has led local church movements among the marginalised, he's helped denominations go through revitalisation programs, and he's a leading voice in the missional movement of the Christian West. Alan Hirsch, welcome to Being Missional. Thanks, Graham. It's good to be with you. You've written a range of books on missional theology and missional church, and one of the books that I've read recently is The Forgotten Ways. Can you describe what you were talking about there? Well, what I was trying to do in that book particularly, I was trying to look at what makes for movements that really change the world, that you know, that really get into hyperbolic growth curves and high impact. So I tried to look under the hood of that. So the early church in China were two test cases that I tried to look into, but I compared, tried to compare notes with what I saw in other situations where you saw exponential impact. And uh, so it's an attempt to describe what factors have got to come together to create movement mm. of that kind. So, uh, yeah, so it's it's really a, a, the centerpiece of my own writing, which kind of guides pretty much everything else I've done since mm. then. You talk about six elements that go into making up apostolic genius and how they come together into something of a synergy. What are some of the elements that you think are critical in that mix? Well, I, I suggest six elements. I call them MDNA or elements mm. of MDNA. Uh, so it goes like this, uh, the centerpiece which holds all of them mm. together is the Jesus Lord, it's a confession. Mm. Uh, and as confession it kind of provides the kind of centerpiece of the, of the movement's kind of theology as well as its kind of attachments, its connection with, with God. Mm. Uh, and I would argue that Jesus Lord is a worldview in a sentence, mm. carries a huge amount of weight. Mm. Uh, Christologically structured theocentrism. Mm. But, um, but uh, so that's the, the one, uh, discipleship and disciple making, that kind of stands for itself. Mm. But uh, the idea that movements are deeply and profoundly mm. committed to reproduction mm. through discipleship. Um, and they, they're pretty keen on it, mm. so like, they take it very seriously. Uh, the next one I look at is incarnational mission, um, which is how the church extends itself over time and space. Outward, sending, impulse, mm. deepening, going down deep into mm. culture, which is the incarnational aspect, the contextualization aspect. Then I look at the, uh, with effectively Ephesians, four categories, that is like having a ministry that is uh, consistent with what we want to do with a movement. So if you want a missional movement, you have to have mm. a missional ministry, and we have to go beyond the Western kind of reduction of ministry down to the shepherd and teacher, or the pastor mm. teacher, which is a reduction, by the way, from the mm. Bible. And so it's kind of reduced our ministry impact mm. as well. So that's kind of a big one. Yeah. Organic systems is the number five, which mm. looks at the organizational system. How do movements organize? Well, it's different mm. to the way we tend to organize. It's going to be the pound mm. function mm. pushed outwards to the outermost limits. And the final one is called communitas. And really it's a type of community that forms in the context of an ordeal or a challenge or a task that restructures the way people relate to each other. Mm. They move from being friends or associates to being comrades. Mm. It's a different kind of love. Mm. And all, all, all six are necessary, I would argue, that for any exponential mm. movement to take place. Mm. How do you think the church has forgotten these things in the context of modernity, in the shaping that happened during Christendom? How did the church forget these things and their centrality for its life and vitality? Yeah, well, I think basically through slowly... Uh, a slow commitment to becoming more and more institutional, which inevitably mm. happens, by the way. Mm. But as the the movements, you know, uh, that you know, you know, the first three hundred years, I mean, it's pretty dynamic movement. Mm. Persecuted, kept underground. I call it pre-institutional. It has all the elements mm. of the potential for institution, but they never have the opportunity or the bandwidth to really create huge mm. institutions. But as soon as Constantine comes in, it just changes its changes tack entirely. Mm. And uh, I think they, the other thing that begins to happen out of that, they begin to kind of sacramentalize the church's forms. Mm. And it's the, so, you know, they, the decisions that were made back then, you know, they, 
we kind of feel that we have to perpetuate them even now, which I, mm. I would argue was bound up with what is seen to be orthodox confession, but it wasn't really. It was just because the church has got to be adaptive in any different setting. It ought to look different in Jerusalem than it does in Corinth. Mm. Um, we're clear about that. So, but you know, but it, I think the European forms became pretty predominant mm. in the mm. institution, and they were persecuted. They mm. they certainly. Uh, worked hard to remove any dissenting voices, mm. sometimes killing them. Mm. What do you think are the habits and practices that sustain such missional DNA in church life? Well, I think first and foremost, I think it's first and foremost a function of leadership. Uh, and I think mm. that where it goes back to the one element, which is about the Ephesians 4, mm. uh, which contains five types of leaders, that, or mm. ministry, I would say, and mm. leadership's implied. But the apostolic, which is the one most responsible for the sentness or the mission of the church. Mm. The prophetic, which is the one that keeps the church, uh, the church's relationship with God intact. So it's about faithfulness and covenant loyalty and the obligations that covenant bring upon a group of people. Uh, then the evangelist is the one who extends through recruiting mm. uh, people to the cause, the shepherd of creating community and a sustainable community. Mm. And then, uh, then the teacher transfers mm. ideas intergenerationally across culture and all that mm. stuff. So I would say all five of those are necessary. And I think, mm. uh, you know, I think when we, we, we kind of reduce it down, we mm. lose our capacity, we forget. So we took mm. out the apostolic. No wonder we, are, we lost the apostolicity, which is yeah. mission. Yeah. You take out the prophetic and you forget how to be faithful. Mm. Take out the evangelistic mm. and you forget how to evangelize, which yeah. actually was prior to the church growth movement was the primary form of the church, was mm. basically shepherds and teachers. Mm. It was perfectly designed to achieve what it was mm. achieving. Mm. Yeah. So you've been one of the leading voices in missional church movement now for decades, but you must at times think, I wonder whether people have always understood what it means to be a missional church. I'm just wondering, what do you think is most misunderstood about what you're saying and about what it means to be a missional church today? Um, a good question. Um, it's hard to put your finger on a singular thing that, that would be mm. the biggest stumbling block, but I would say, um, I think the, the, the assumption is that churches do mission. I think that's a mistake. I think one of the big paradigm shifts that we are called to kind of embrace is that mm. actually God is a missionary and we join with him. Mm. So mission is fundamentally a subset of theology, not a subset mm. of ecclesiology. Uh, mm. It's part of the doctrine of God, not the doctrine of the church, which means mm. that it's not, not something we produce. We, we join with God in the sense of what the Wesleyan mm. movement calls uh, prevenient grace, that God is already mm. involved uh, in the world and we join with mm. him, which is quite a radical concept, mm. uh, that we can find God everywhere. And I think mm. it's a big shift for people. Mm. And then what one that goes along with that is the kind of idea of incarnational mission. We've forgotten mm. how to adapt. And I mm. would argue if you sent and you are incarnational, mm. you have to be adaptive. Mm. So we become so attached mm. to the forms and get so attached. Yeah. And we sacramentalize and we make them sacred. And then once you've done that, they don't change. Mm. Because they've got Bible verses mm. next to, you know, mm. written theologies, hundreds of them about mm. the church. And, uh, but it's a paradigm we mm. baptize, not the real thing. Mm. So... The, the word missional has proliferated, and in some ways I suppose it's good that people are thinking now about what it might mean to be missionary. But are you ever, are, are you ever concerned that there's something of a domestication sure. or a watering down sure. of the word? Where do you, how do you see that happening and how do you think we might begin to yeah. respond to that? Yeah, I think, the, the, uh, I think part of the, res well, how does it happen is that... Um, mm. When everything becomes missional, nothing's missional. Mm. So now you get missional Sunday school, missional Greek, missional mm. this, <laughs> missional that. And I just wonder really yeah. if we've maintained what the word really means. Yeah. Sentness is kind of about mm. mission. And, uh, it's, you know, I'm not sure if you can have missional Greek. Maybe you can. Mm. I'm not so sure about it. Mm. Um, but uh, I think there are people, you know, I think God raises up to maintain some mm. sort of clarity. Our friend Michael Frost being a mm. case in mm. point. I think, you know, one of his jobs is to keep reminding us that mm. we haven't arrived yet and, uh, yeah. and um, you know, and that we, we, we've, we've yet to really begin to grapple mm. with everything that the missional mm. 
uh, approach to Bible and and Christian life really brings us. We're only mm. just probing it right now mm. because the paradigm has been pretty much mm. lost. Well, where do you see the growing edges in this conversation? Where, where do you see it beginning to explore new horizons? Well, a number of things. I mean, we're seeing some experimentation in new forms mm. uh, of church. Uh, at least in the States, there's quite a lot of stuff going on in what we call third places, which mm. is kind of places where people gather for recreation mm. and, uh, and uh, renewal. Um, there's a huge amount of stuff going on there. There's a lot of stuff about mm. neighborhood and engaging across your streets mm. and in reclaiming the neighbor mm. and the neighborhood as a kind of primary place of mission. Mm. Church planting, um, well, they're the natural missionaries, although mm. I think the way we've tended to do that has been in a mm. church growth me mentality. So we've tended to just reproduce mm. what we call box church. But mm. I think at, at the same time, there's, there's quite a lot of interest in missional approaches and technique mm. from the church planting wing. Mm. So a lot of the, the movements uh, for church planting are mm. most likely to be interested in the missional conversation, which mm. is what I found has been very mm. true. I mean, being an Australian and remembering something of the way in which the larger churches reacted at times to the missional conversation and felt threatened by it. I get a sense that in the US, though, there are larger churches that are more courageously exploring what yep. this might mean for them. And is that true? And how do you see some of that happening here in the US? Yes, yeah. yeah, so now there's no doubt about it. I mean, like, the, the mm. I, I was quite shocked at the difference between the two contexts. Yeah. I was used to, as you know, yeah. being run out of town, right? <laughs> uh, we were even banned by another We can laugh about it now. But <laughs> yeah, <we can>. yeah. <laughs> I mean, I definitely was a persona non grata with some of those guys. I honestly think they never, they were insecure. Mm. Uh, uh, well, I'd say holus bolus, but a, a lot of mm. more insecure about it. Uh, mm. And because people have deeply invested in that paradigm, are very. it's very hard for them mm. to see outside of the paradigm. Mm. And then there's just in Aussie culture, it's just not a, a, a deep commitment to entrepreneurial mm. effort. It's, it's risk adverse. It's isn't very it? risk adverse. Mm. In fact, I, every time mm. I go back, I realize actually it's become a nanny, more and more a nanny yeah. state. Now, maybe it's just me living in this, which is not mm. nanny state, mm. but it's becoming more and more legislated for mm. every aspect of life, which is concerning actually, because mm. I think the kind of mischievousness has been taken out, which mm. I think is part of what it means to be mm. an innovator. And it affects the culture of the churches too, yeah. I think, doesn't it? Not just society at yeah. large. In America, mm. yeah, that's true. And in America, there's mm. a natural forward leaning. They, the mm. hero is the person who's capable of mm. actually pioneering new territory. Mm. They've got a more willingness to try new things. And mm. um, we work very much on the kind of diffusion of innovation curve. So we, mm. we, I tend to focus literally all my efforts, mm. most of them, the vast majority, on the people that would have innovator, early adopter style. Mm. In, in, in this country, there's a fair few of them, so yeah. I can just focus on that and I can, mm. I don't need to convince anyone anymore. Mm. And most people are saying, you can stop shouting. Mm. Now show, let's, let's see how we can do yeah. this together. Let's find a way to do this. Mm. So there's, it's been very exciting yeah. and I, I could never have predicted it. Mm. Right? And you're seeing the innovator, early adopter types across the various spectrum of the church, so planting to denominations yeah. to large yeah. churches right yeah. across? right across the spectrum, and mm. as well as denominationally, from mm. anything from Pentecostal through to Methodists, you know, I mean mainline Methodism, mm. through to Presbyterians, and no, it's been, mm. it's been quite remarkable. Mm. Now, I think the response is if you're, you know, if you're high church mm. ecclesiology, I mean, I think you're, there's bigger challenges because, you're, you know, the theology mm. is a pretty hard wire to the Christendom mode. Mm which is hard to become genuinely missional. I'm not mm. saying it can't happen. Mm. Missionality can take place in any form. Mm. But I think a genuinely, consistently missional movement, uh, it, it, it's a challenge to very mm. the high church forms, mm. but nonetheless, there's still an engagement. Mm. So the Anglicans are the, in, the, mm. in, in this country, which kind of break away from the, pres mm. uh, from the Episcopalians, are actually very mm. strong into church planting mm. and trying to find their way into it. Mm. I'll ask you a question as a theological lecturer um, based at a ministry training centre. Where do you see colleges in the US and, and outside the US as well exploring with new models of training that help equip people to be missionary in their whatever context it is that they find themselves in? Right, to be honest with you, I, uh, this is an interesting one. I said, 
again, the doctor ministry style, style programs mm. tend to be more that way inclined. Mm. That is, they're professional degrees where you spend mm. vast majority of your study mm. in the context you come in on maybe a few mm. weeks a year. Now, we're seeing a proliferation of that mm. uh, in Masters of, Master of Arts, not mm. MDiv level, but Master of Arts is a number of programs that are doing that. But I've got to be honest and saying, like, I don't think there's any fundamentally new paradigms uh, happening. And um, it'd be interesting to see what's happening mm. because actually a lot of seminaries in this country, most mm. of them perhaps are in big, big trouble mm. with, with the collapse economically five, six mm. years ago. You know, they haven't recovered and then they probably won't recover very easily mm. and they're going to have to find a new way of mm. uh, being, you know, seminary. Um, yeah. And it's sustainable because it's extremely yeah. costly in this country. Mm. And I know for a fact that most students, while they end up of a three-year degree, having about eighty to hundred thousand dollar in mm. loans, it takes them mm. years to get rid of them, maybe even a lifetime. There's no guarantee of a job anymore, so there's mm. all that stuff now. The you know, mm. it's I don't know. I think seminary is mm. in big trouble. Mm. And maybe some of that malaise, some of that difficulty might force people to be more courageous about yeah. training models and oh, approaches. absolutely. I think pain can be a great teacher. Mm. I say never waste a crisis mm. um, because I think they can teach us in a time of crisis, uh, you can learn things that you can never learn. Mm. You're not likely to mm. learn when everything's comfortable, mm. right? So, mm. so I think that, that a lot of seminaries have been, other denominational ones mm. or highly funded ones of very pampered institutions, mm. have been tails that wag the mm. dog at times. Mm. Whereas I think it's meant to be a servant mm. organization that trains people for the ministry and mission. Mm. So I think it's an opportunity for mm. leaders to really take mm. charge and, and mm. lead, lead these organizations mm. into change. In the various things that, that you do in your role as a leader in the missional church movement, what gives you most joy? What do you love most about what you do? I get to meet the best yeah. I'm saying I, my, I yeah. work primarily in the in the first world, so in the in the Western yeah. context. But I think I get to meet the very best Christians, mm. and I love them, man. I just think mm. it's just it's just been awesome. I've met some wonderful, wonderful people, mm. and I've managed to avoid the not so wonderful ones. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure they're there. I yeah. just never met them. Yes. <laughs> so, so it's I'm having a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, I see just the engagement of these ideas, and willing to try new things, and. And seeing some real movement happening, it's, mm. uh, yeah, it's, uh, I'm actually quite hopeful. And mm. I think you'd remember me as not mm. being such a, or, you know, somewhat of a hand-wringing kind of prophet type back in Australia. Over here, mm. I'm definitely more the hopeful optimist. Mm. Mm. I think we're kind of seeing some stuff mm. that might change things. Mm. Well, one of the things I'm working at at the moment uh, um, is a thing called 100 Movements, which is going to be a highly selective group of churches that mm. are on the front foot. Mm. Uh, likely to kind of engage into becoming movements. Mm. So we, we're going to choose them, we're going to invite them into processes up to five years of learning, mm. and we're going to commit everything we can. I'm talking brains mm. trust, everything. You know, we're going to create resources, test instruments, the whole deal. Mm. That, that, the idea is if we can birth a hundred movements that go exponential, mm. they will write the maps that others mm. will follow and they will change history. You know, so mm. it's, uh, it's my last bid. And mm. kind of leaving a legacy, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I'm excited about yeah. that, actually. That's very good. That's great. And what are you writing at the moment? I don't know if you want to give us a preview for, of something oh. you're working on at the moment. But... I, I've got three uh, three projects on at the moment. I haven't written mm. for about two, a little over two years now, so mm. it's getting cranking it up again, trying mm. to get back into the rhythm of it. But um, So one is on uh, articulating the fivefold, not so much as vocation, which I've done before, mm. Uh, but as the marks of the church, that is, mm. you know, looking uh, to, to test whether the church is being true to the ministry of Christ, which I mm. articulate as fivefold. Mm. Uh, and then seeing to what degree does the body of Christ correspond to the ministry of Christ. And that can mm. be tested. Mm. That can be identified, tested. So that's one mm. of them. And there's a test instrument I'm developing at the mm. moment on that too, which will help churches do kind of a, a diagnostic mm. using the fivefold as a diagnostic of the church yeah. itself, as its organisation. So I'm yeah. quite excited about yeah. that. It's more, um, it's more my geeky side. The other one I, I, I am genuinely excited about is actually more evangelistic. It's trying to um, understand 
a, 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 a larger register of human emotion and human response to God. Uh, mm. I think that the church in the West has largely reduced the gospel down to justification by faith, which I believe in, by the way. I'm, I, mm. I, I'll take atonement anyway yeah. if God wants to give it to me. Yeah. But um, And be thankful. Um, but I think that we've limited down that way. And there's so many other ways that, mm. the, that the gospel can be brought to bear on human existential concerns mm. so you know so how do people express that differently and then how can we bring the gospel mm. to be and also can how, how can christians find god in, in mm. you know in a much mm. bigger register than we traditionally mm. have again mm. too so it's mm. kind of looking two ways so that's really an interesting mm. project i'm kind of more in the early stage of that uh but early early on that and then final one is more on discipling organizations mm. Can you do that, building habits mm. um, into the life of organizations so you can recode them along the mm. lines of disciples? Mm. They're becoming discipling agencies themselves. Mm. And uh, how that works, uh, mm. looking underneath the hood of mm. uh, Peter Bodoko's habitus, mm. uh, but trying to rework it out on a level of organization. Mm. Alan Hirsch, thank you for joining us at Being Missional. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. for having me. Good to Good. see you again. Though. You too. The Global Church Project is located at www.theglobalchurchproject.com. On our website, you'll find a wide range of interviews and resources for colleges, universities and churches. I look forward to your company next time. From me, goodbye.